Please welcome our moderator, Len Downey, and our special guest, Harry Rosenfeld. Thanks. I see a lot of familiar faces out there, so we'll be careful during question time who we call on. <laughs> uh, I, want, I want to begin at the outset by saying that Harry changed my life. I've not had an opportunity to say this publicly and to thank Harry publicly before, so this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, uh, I was an investigative reporter in my early days at the Washington Post, and when Harry became assistant managing editor in charge of the local news staff in 1970, I believe it was, uh, he decided that um, uh, I, I needed to be doing something else, and he put me on the city desk, which I thought was like the end of the world, because I expected to be an investigative reporter for the rest of my life. And instead, it changed my life. I realized that I really enjoyed being an editor, and I probably was better at being an editor than doing anything else. And except for a, 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 some tenure in the uh, London Bureau of the Washington Post as our correspondent there for several years, the whole rest of my career was spent uh, as an editor at the Post. And I really have Harry to thank for that. Uh, I, I don't know what he saw, what he, why he decided to do that, but it, was, uh, it really changed me. I knew you would win a lot of Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> See? He's prescient. Uh, I also worked very closely, obviously, with Harry during those Watergate years when I was his deputy on the Metro staff. Uh, and I thought I came to know him really, really well. But when I saw this remarkable, this really remarkably candid, detailed book, detailed memoir of his uh, time, uh, his life and his time in journalism, I realized that there was so much in there that I didn't know about Harry, which really fascinated me. And I want to begin with some of that right now, which is what was it like growing up in Hitler's Germany and uh, what was Kristallnacht like, like? And how did, your, how, did you get to, how did your family get to be there in the first place? Uh, well, uh all the things of Kristallnacht and those events that preceded it uh, were part of my everyday life in, in Germany growing up. And it, it was such a, a pervasive anti-Semitism and a sense of separation and segregation uh, that if you had removed it uh, by some miraculous touch, uh, it would have astonished me. It, it would have made me feel uncomfortable. It would not have been the world that I grew up in and, and knew how to live in. Uh, but as bad as it got increasingly from the time uh, that uh, Hitler took power in 1933, uh, and in stages it got worse and worse and worse. Uh, German Jews were denied citizenship. Uh, all Jews were denied uh, economic uh, opportunity. They were restricted in how they could make their living. Doctors were, were segregated. They had to advertise with different colored placards. And this was a pervasive uh, feeling, and, and that's just how it was. But it got really bad in the year 1938, which was a bad year for the world, but it was a catastrophic one for the Jews. It was bad because that was the year of Munich, and when the uh, Western powers, Italy, uh, France, and Great Britain ceded uh, parts of Czechoslovakia in order to tame Hitler's hunger and only incited it and incited the Soviet Nazi pact as a consequence. And for the Jews, and for particularly for my family, we were Polish Jews. My father had emigrated to Berlin in 1917, recruited to be a furrier at a high fashion house. And they had lived and succeeded in Germany very well. They did very well for themselves. And even during Nazi times, with the restrictions, one way or another, he did all right. But in October of that year, 1938, he was arrested in the middle of the night by Gestapo agents who came to our home and took him away without being able, they said, to tell us why. We found out very quickly, although he didn't know where he was for three days, that he had been deported along with other Polish nationals, Polish Jews, to Poland. And he was one of the lucky ones because the Poles admitted his train through their border, as well as they admitted two other train loads. But the 10,000 or so other Jews that were so rounded up, many including women and children, were not permitted, and they were dumped into a no-man's land in a very hazardous uh, situation on the border between Germany and Poland. Well, not three weeks later, after my father was taken away, 
and we knew now where he was, safe in Warsaw with his relatives. Another man came to our door who never had come to our door before. He was a uh, friend of, uh, he was the son of friends of my parents. And his wife was a secretary in the office of the propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels. And because of that connection, he had been useful to my parents over the years in ways that I don't know. I was nine years old. But he never came to our house. He only phoned with information. This day he came, ripped the nameplate off our rear door, which was behind the first shop, and told us immediately to gather ourselves together and run to the Polish embassy. Bad things were about to happen. The bad thing was Kristalna. When we got to the embassy, we, there were uh, many, many Polish Jews already there seeking asylum. And Kristalna was as bad as it ever had been for Jews in Germany. In the parlance of today, that's when the Nazis crossed a red line. And when they crossed that red line with impunity, they knew they could cross any red line they wanted to cross. And as a we, we came home that night, our apartment was not sacked, our store was not sacked for reasons I can't explain. The store was shuttered, as it always was, as a first store. But there are many, many reasons why it may have been spared. But the next day, I asked my mother, I nagged her, actually, I didn't ask her, to let me go to the temple where I had been going to school at an, as an, at an annex after they kicked Jews like me out of the public schools in 1937. And I wanted to see what it was going on there, knowing that synagogues were being burned. And I did see it burn. And I saw the firemen standing at the ready, fully equipped, but not there to put out the flames, but simply there to make sure that adjacent properties would not be damaged. Well, these are memories that have stayed with me all my life, and many others, anecdotal uh, and evidence at best, because I was nine years old by the time we left, and my 17-year-old sister and my doting parents made, I'm certain, sure, that they spared me from the worst parts of, of uh, the abuses and indignities that they had to suffer. But, as it does to all of us. Our experiences help shape us for better or for ill. And what happened to me as a youngster in Germany, and remember what happened to me was nothing compared to what happened to so many others, has remained with me all my life. And as I regarded my career and my retirement and decided that I would write a memoir, it became clear to me that those events had an awful lot to do with what I became as an American in the first place and as a newspaper man in the second. How did you escape from Germany? Well, we didn't escape. Uh, we, we, we escaped in a metaphorical sense. Yes. But uh, we had been seeking to emigrate to America since 1934, the year after Hitler became chancellor. And we were Polish Jews, so we were under the Polish quota. The Polish quota was a small quota designed to be small by the Congress of the United States in the 1920s when they sought to limit immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe and, and welcome it more from Northern and Western Europe. And Polish Jews, of course, fell under the Polish quota. And in the State Department, very high pub officials of the State Department, not the Secretary of State, but immediately below him, were, were uh, outspoken anti-Semites who were determined not to have Jews come to the United States and put every bureaucratic impediment that they could think of in the way of that happening. So we did not receive our quota number for five years, in March of 39, we received it. And when we received it, my father was permitted by the Nazis to come back to Germany, to Berlin, to accompany us uh, to leave for the United States. By that time, 
the Nazis were still permitting and wanting Jews to leave. Uh, they hadn't reached that other step of rounding them up and, and systematically killing them. So we left on uh, April 16, 1939. We landed in New York City on May 16, 1939, and that's the day that I became an American. That, when I set foot on American soil, I put everything, everything about my German childhood behind me, and I wanted nothing to do with it, neither the language nor the memory, and I threw myself into the American way of life. And then how did you become a journalist in what was not your first language and wind up at a relatively early age at the New York Herald Tribune, which then was one of the best papers in the United States? Well, I knew before, I knew how, how your, your childhood influences your, your, uh, your future. The Nazis inculcated a, a stereotype of the Jew <clears throat> that permitted the Jews one virtue. They were good at business and finance. And that was really integrated by me. And I would do anything, anything, but not go into business or finance <laughs> or anything related. <laughs> now, my mother wanted me to be a dentist. But in a great humanitarian gesture, unsurpassed even by Nelson Mandela, I declined that job. <laughs> Look at the pain I have spared how many people by not becoming a dentist. I can attest I would not have wanted him to be my dentist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I knew I wanted to do something of public service. <clears throat> and in my youth, that range focused early on, before I graduated high school, on journalism. So I knew I wanted to be a journalist. But in high school, uh, we were obliged to take, subscribe to a local paper in New York City uh, for, in our homeroom. It was part, you had to do it. Well, most everybody signed up for the New York Times because it was that kind of a high school. And, and <laughs> <laughs> that kind of got under my skin. So I said, no, I will take the New York Herald Tribune. And I did, and I became acquainted with it, and I loved it. And when I graduated high school, there was an interregnum of some nine months. I graduated in January, and I would not start college till September. I wanted a job. By this time, I knew it was a job in journalism. I knew where the Herald Tribune was located. I had seen it physic its facade physically. I went there, and I got a job. Not the job I was looking for. I was looking for a copy boy's job, but they were fresh out of copy boy jobs. But they did have a job as a shipping clerk in the shipping room of the syndicate of the Herald Tribune. And I took that job saying, this is a foot in the door. And that's how I wound up at the Herald Tribune. And they, uh, re they were evidently pleased by my work and rehired me every summer during college. And then I was drafted and got to see Korea. And uh, after I returned from uh, Korea, they hired me again as a typist. Uh, but pretty soon I wiggled my way into a job as an editor at the Herald Tribune News Service. And then years later, uh, after distinguished service at the Herald Tribune, particularly in the foreign staff, uh, and then as foreign editor of the Washington Post, where you moved later, uh, you were moved over to, you were promoted to become the assistant managing editor for Metropolitan News at the Washington Post. And a young man named Bob Woodward contacted you because he, like you, uh, he had been reading the Washington Post, and he also had no journalism background. He wanted to work at the Washington Post, and what happened? Well, it depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Woodward likes to say that he walks in off the street I looked at his resume, he laughed in his face, and sent him away, albeit to a job at a, a local uh, weekly paper in Montgomery County. What really happened <laughs> was that uh, Paul Ignatius, who was the president of the Washington Post at the time, and the former secretary of the Navy, had recommended young Bob Woodward. Who had the, been in the Navy. Yeah, well, the point was, even for me to uh, get, uh, facilitated him getting a job someplace else after a two-week tryout, which he failed miserably. Uh, 
was the fact that he had served five years as a naval officer, a good number of them in intelligence. And I had interviewed a lot of uh, prospective hires in that job as Metro editor. None had ever come to me with those credentials. And I was very interested. And he was also what, what you know him to be. He was very down to earth and sober sided, very serious. And, and you could see that he exuded that. He exuded reliability. And never was a, 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 a impulsive judgment more accurately made than the one that I had vis-a-vis -vis him as a character. He proved himself as a journalist, I must say, in his couple of years, in his year, and it was a year, uh, at the, at the uh, Sentinel, at mm -hmm. which time he stuck it to us pretty good. That was a paper in Montgomery County, a weekly newspaper in Montgomery County. And after a year's time, we, we hired him along with a number of other outstanding people. I remember Colin Barker was in that group. And is Colin here? He is. There right you there. go. I'm glad you called you out. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. So uh, let's fast forward to uh, June 17th of uh, 1972. Um, how, how did how did you first discover what was going on with Watergate? How did you make the coverage decisions that were made? How did Bob and Carl get teamed up? How did how did this become a local story? Well. It became a local story because it was a burglary. And burglary is the stuff of, of a metropolitan staff. That's not something that the national staff, which normally should be covering something of the scope of Watergate, would do. So it starts off as a burglary, albeit at the Democratic National Headquarters. And not bad that those headquarters were in the Watergate complex. You know, that resonates with the Washington audience. So it was, uh, Howard Simons called me on that Saturday morning. And he tells me about uh, this break-in at the Watergate, and he also tells me about another important story <laughs> that we had to cover <laughs> that day. Actually, it was a m much more human story. Uh, there was a couple making love in Arlington, Virginia. I know that's hard to believe, but... <laughs> <laughs> and in the middle, they were interrupted by a car that smashed into their bedroom. <laughs> and I think of the terror of that event. <laughs> And I have, and uh, I called Barry Sussman to alert him to the Watergate story because Barry was the District of Columbia editor, and the Watergate complex was in the District of Columbia, still is, I understand. <laughs> and um, we talked about who would be on it, and of course Al Lewis, our top-notch cop reporter, would be on it. This involved cops. And then we talked about who else should be on it. And both of us agreed that Bob Woodward, in his year or so, on the staff, maybe a little bit more, had shown himself. Actually, such less. A, less? Yeah. He, Nine he, months. He was, Nine so, months. Um, he, he was so dedicated to his work. He took it so seriously. It was so good. It was so uh, thorough. This is the guy you want on a story that has potential, but you don't understand just what kind of potential. And, and Carl, who's the, <laughs> who's Carl the opposite was, uh, of what uh, you just Carl, described, Bob? Carl has. was on the premises. <laughs> uh, Carl was uh, working that Saturday. And Carl always uh, was unhappy with having been sequestered on the local staff. And he wanted to be any place else but, but, but the local staff. That means he was always a, uh, edging to get onto a national assignment even if it was only a weather roundup or something of the kind. Uh, and he was working on Saturday. And he, of course, a lot of people, there were about, I think, eight or nine other reporters besides Bob and Carl who worked on that first day story. Uh, and they pulled together a beautiful package under the editorship of Barry Sussman. And it was really a comprehensive package. Uh, with, with details, with office schematics, with sidebars, really trenchants and on the point, leaving everybody else behind. And that really established our toehold, uh, both in the, in, the, in, the, in the world of journalism, uh, but to begin with, more important, in the world of the Washington Post. And we did not ever, ever loosen our grip on that story, even in those 
months ahead after they stopped laughing at us and the national staff wanted to take it away from us, we managed to hold on to it. An undercurrent in this book, as well as in our lives at the time, was the competition between the Metro staff for the Post and the national staff for the Post. The national staff was famous, had famous reporters on it. We knew it was the apple of Ben's eye. And at first, they really didn't believe our story at all. The late David Broder told me years later how uh, he just couldn't imagine that the President of the United States could be involved in something like that. Uh, and the whole rest of the journalism world, there was no internet then. There was no Twitter, none of that sort of thing that would be going on now. And so the Washington Post was left alone for most of 1972 on that story, while Mrs. Graham was being told by all of her friends that the Post was making a terrible mistake. The Post had just gone public, so its stock price was, uh, was in the balance. Uh, Baby Rebozo, Pre uh, President Nixon's friend, had challenged the licenses of the Washington Post television stations. There was incredible amounts of pressure. And of course, the, the Nixon administration was constantly railing against the Post almost every day. At, uh, at Ron Ziegler's briefings, creating this tremendous pressure on the paper and a tremendous pressure on, on you because you were in charge of it on the Metro staff. How did you handle that? Well, w once I recognized that the story had the legs that it did have, or that it had legs that would take us for more than a, a short run. And that came when John Mitchell resigned two weeks after the break-in, he resigned as head of the committee to re-elect the president. Well, he said he did it because he's going to stay home and take care of Martha. <laughs> and that didn't produce a laugh, but in my time, that would have <laughs> produced did. a laugh. Because we knew what Martha Mitchell was like. <laughs> and, and, so, and so I knew from that point on, not that it would go to Nixon, but that it would go fairly high up. And I knew, I knew, I knew what was at stake. I knew about the stock price. I knew about the television station. I knew the Washington Post, which had been brought to such eminence through the efforts of Catherine Graham and Ben Bradley all these years and were making steady progress and really achieving a national reputation or at, 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 at the threshold of such. Uh, all that was in danger if, if, if we blew this one. And I read every word of every story and I searched their brains as, as hard as I could to understand every aspect of it. And they were very, very good. They were very diligent in this. And if we had questions, they went back out and got more answers. And it was that kind of scrutiny. And that's how, however much I scrutinized it, Howard Simon scrutinized me and when I brought it to him. And, and so you had several layers of scrutiny, and then after, Howard was more involved at the beginning than Ben was, but once Ben did get involved, then you had still another layer, and so that, that kind of scrutiny turned out a story that, in my experience, and I spent more than 50 years in the trade, I've never seen it be so unblemished by errors as, uh, for so long as Watergate was. Not that there weren't mistakes, there were mistakes, but they were pretty well controlled. There was one very bad one, but we may or may not get to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, you, went, you went on to the Albany Times Union. Yes. Uh, and became, uh, the, what was the title there? Editor-in-Chief, Executive Editor? Ed editor of the uh, Times Union and right. of the Knickerbocker well, News. That's right. These which was papers. the afternoon paper. Right, right. right. And, and uh, I was at the same time running the Washington Post, and we both ran into the digital age, right. <laughs> uh, which began to change everything that we knew. Right. Uh, I, I love the fact that this title says Memoirs of a Newspaper Man, because uh, that's the, people keep asking now whether newspapers are going to live or die anymore, uh, and, uh, which we can talk about another time. But um, uh, so how did, you, how did you approach that? All this change going on, the survival of newspapers seemed to be at stake, the whole question about how you deal with the internet and so on. Uh, I, I, you used a phrase in the book, um, a rear guard action, uh, that you felt that you were, you were undertaking as the editor of the Albany well, Times. Well, I, I, uh, when I was doing, first of all, you absorb the technology uh, because you have to absorb it. In the first place, the new technology before the digital age, but. Uh, but uh, before, when we, uh, just at the, uh, at the ante room of it, uh, it brought great benefits to newspapers, to print papers. 
because all of a sudden they eliminated the production part of the, of the overhead. And all of a sudden, the newsroom was doing everything. They were not only writing the stories and editing the stories, they were not only writing the headlines, but they, they were putting them onto the page, seeing how the headlines fit. It was no longer being done somewhere down the hall by people in, in jeans and, and denim shirts. And, and uh, Not that there's anything wrong with that. that no, the point being that it, was a white, it became a white-collar job yeah. instead of a blue-collar job. And, and uh, that, that led to a lot of money landing on the bottom line of the newspapers. So that was good. And that was a gradual integration. Well, it was good for the people who weren't blue-collar workers. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, it was good for the management of newspapers. And uh, so the technology, you had to absorb it stage by stage. And at the Times Union, we were, in, and at Knickerbocker News, we were not at the cutting edge of this being a much smaller newspaper, we would get it on the second bounce, sort of. So it was, other people had already conquered that world when we got into it. So we integrated ourselves, usually without great pain. Uh, the, the editor who would be the newsroom supervisor of, of, of getting the staff up to speed, adopting the various forms of computers we would get one year and one one, then another more sophisticated, then a third more sophisticated. Each level of sophistication brought more tasks to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the people's hands. They were then obliged to do more things than they had ever done in their lives, and it took some doing. So to encourage their great fear, uh, Mike Spain, who at the Times Union was in charge of this, would use me as the guinea pig. Guinea pig. I would get the, the first electric typewriter, I would get the first this, that, and that, that, and when this idiot could do it, the staff knew they could do it. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, before we take questions, and uh, as you did in your book, which is going back to the beginning again, uh, in 1998 you, gave, uh, you were asked to give a 60th anniversary speech to your synagogue in Albany. Uh, and um, uh, I, I'd like to hear what you felt was your mission in giving that speech, and that reminds me to ask you, who is Gustav? Um, that was the 60th anniversary of, of Kristana, and the rabbi of my congregation, having found out in the story about my retirement, about my childhood, wanted me to speak on that occasion. And I said I would, but when I sat down to pull my thoughts together, it brought back uh, really uh, painful memories. And frankly, I'd sublimated all the years that I had spent as an American making my American life, getting married, having a family, having grandchildren. And I focused very hard and I told the story, basically the story that I've told you, because I know little more about it than what I've shared with you this afternoon. And uh, some years later, I received a phone call. It was August. I was at home alone. My wife Ann was out with our daughter Stephanie and her three th children. And the man identified himself as Roger Lowen. He's a neighbor of yours. He lives in, in Arlington, Virginia, I believe. And he asked me whether I remembered his cousin, Gustav Löwenstein, from Berlin. And I said, I did not. And he said, I have a letter that's dated April 1939 that says, in German, he wrote to his uncle and aunt in America that his friend Harry Rosenfeld had left for the United States with his parents, and he had nobody left to play with. I, I had never, and I said, well, tell me more about your cousin, because how many Harry Rosenfelds could there have been to have left Berlin in April of 1939, and he began to describe him more fully by saying that he lived with his father 
in Berlin. And then memory clicked, and I remembered his, who he was, and I said, I had a friend who lived with his father with a Jewish family, and he was an apple-cheeked boy. I remembered what he looked like. And he said, that is your friend, Gustav. And then, <clears throat> then he told me what had happened to uh, Gustav and his father. <clears throat> and it was no mystery. It was not something that was unknown to me. Quite the contrary. But to hear the details of it, they were put in a work camp in Berlin for a couple of years before they were deported to a work camp in Estonia where both were put to death. That was very hard for me to take. Not because I didn't know what happened in the Holocaust, but the, the particularization, the focus on Gustav, my buddy, that, that was very hard for me to take. It is still hard for me to take. You can see why now, having read this book, I know Harry better than I thought I knew Harry all those years. Um, to take questions now, and you have to use the microphone, please, because we're being recorded. And because we're being recorded, I think you want to be nice to Harry, those of you who might have an inclination not to be. Uh, since today is Pearl Harbor Day, I'm wondering if you could share any memories you have of that day 72 years ago. Well, Pearl Harbor Day came when I was a very young man. And I was a young boy. I wasn't a man. Eleven. And, and uh, we had, that was a generation that was caught up in the Second World War. We followed, especially after December 7th, but also before. We followed what was happening very closely in the newspapers. We were aware of these strange foreign names where battles had been won and lost. And when it came to America's involvement, I think it was almost a little bit like the dropping of the second shoe. There was an inevitability of America's involvement that even kids were aware of, and obviously the affinity of the United States f for the European allies. It was still a stunner, because it was a stunner of such magnitude, because we, our country had been caught such, in such an unaware condition and had been punished. We didn't know how badly we had been punished, except that we had been punished. Uh, but the resolve of this country that derived from that act, and this was a country divided on the participation in the war, very seriously and deeply divided. Uh, the draft passed by one vote, uh, had one vote cast together. No, it passed by one vote, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, but the war, that attack unified the country. Looking back now, I can say in a way that it has never been unified before, since. Okay, next question. Hi, I'd like to ask a journalism question. You've lived through the New York Herald Tribune, the Washington Post. Journalism began as something that, that high school graduates did, and it was a trade. It's evolved into a profession. Now it's involved, evolved into sort of a hobby with bloggers, et cetera. Et cetera. I'm sort of curious, What's been the most important change you've felt as a good one and a bad one in terms of journalism as a, as a culture of professionalism, amateurism, or just an everyday trade? Well, I think I have to disagree with you a little bit. To this day, it is not a profession. It doesn't have uh, uh, agreed upon standards of ethics. It doesn't have agreed upon standards of education and qualification. And that has to be in that way because under the First Amendment, anybody can do this kind of work. Uh, by my time, you had it pretty damn well had to have a college education, or at least some of it. 
Some of the old timers that I met as a really young newspaper man did not, but they were even rare. And they had at least some college, two or three years. Uh, it was always a great thing to be, though. I mean, whether you, you, you had the bona fides of a, of a college education or not, uh, uh, it's a great line of work. And it, and it brought into it people who, who were, by and large, very pleased to be doing that. And I think would be kind of unhappy having to do anything else. God knows you didn't do it in order to become rich, because with very the rarest exceptions, you didn't become rich. Uh, I agree with you that it's changing tremendously. I must say that I lived, uh, Leonard lived, uh, through the golden age of journalism. Mm -hmm. Howard Simons knew we were living through the golden age of journalism. He said that to me. We are living after us, you know. <laughs> and I thought it was just talk, right? But he turned out to be prescient. And we were there with these exciting stories. Think about it. The civil rights movement that turned this country upside down, turned journalism upside down. Because we used to run with the cops. That was the way you did it. We stopped running with the cops during that and during the Vietnam protests and the Vietnam probes and all of that. And then came the Pentagon Papers. And then came Watergate. That really, really turned the sock inside out for the American nation. And the standards changed and they hardened for the better. Uh, there was a tough-mindedness. The judges didn't like being examined. They still don't, but they are examined these days, though they, the way they were not when I was a young newspaper man. And you know, the authoritarians, the establishment, was pretty much um, living in a, in a, in a pretty uh, protected cocoon. They have not been since that time. So it's changed enormously. Now it's changing again with all, all of this. I mean, there, there's good and bad in what's happening. The good is that Watergate would have been out a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. The bad is it would have been out with a lot of misinformation <laughs> that would have undermined the credibility of that, the earlier reporting. And that's what scares me. That's what scares me. Will the new technologies don't scare me. It doesn't matter to me what the format is. What matters to me, what is the content? And I am not overly impressed by the content produced nowadays by these newer forms. There is some good in there, not nearly enough. In the middle, I believe, there. Yeah. What was it like getting off the boat when you were nine years old and coming to America? Did you have family here? Yes. Switching we, over? Well, we, we landed on the, on the Quinault Pier on the west side of Manhattan. We came aboard the SS Aquitania. And uh, when I was standing, we didn't stop at Ellis Island. We, uh, the, Immigration work was done by, a, by an immigration official who joined the, the Aquitania somewheres out and handled all that paperwork on the ship. And I was standing at the rail with my mother, and we looked down on the pier, and she said, here is Tante Frida, there's Uncle Willie, there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and after all those years apart, uh, and she recognized them, and we had quite a lot of uh, I had quite a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins uh, in America. And um, I looked down, and it was a, a great sight. It was a puzzling sight. I knew none of these people. But we, got, we came off, went through the rigmarole of debarking, and we got into a taxi cab to be driven to my Uncle Willie's home in the Bronx, where we stayed for a week. And we drove up Riverside Park, and I looked at the uh, drive. And I looked at the apartment houses, which were by themselves. They weren't skyscrapers, but they were impressive. And that was my first uh, sight of America. And I tell you, in that moment, I, I, I drew into, into my lungs the air of America and into my being. I was just wondering, as an editor, how you handled the enigma of Deep Throat and how you what, how you felt when you learned later that it was Mark Felt? Well, Deep Throat was Deep Throat uh, because Howard Simons named him that. He had been known as Woodward's friend up to that time. He was, he was, uh, he was, uh, I don't think Howard meant anything special by that. Uh, 
Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I have to avoid one second about this. We made Bob and Carl write up all the notes of all their interviews. And they had to put at the top the name of the person they interviewed, even though most of them were confidential sources who we were never going to identify publicly. Internally, we needed to know who they were in order to judge the material. At the top of the notes taken from Deep Throat, it said, MF. And Bob always told us that was my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and we believed him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, there came a time when I did, uh, he, you know, he didn't come to us with chiefs, uh, documents of secret government uh, papers and saying, here, look at this. <laughs> and, you know, he said, uh, uh, he confirmed information. He said, oh boy, are you guys on the wrong track. Uh, you're going to ruin the country if you keep on going this way. He was very valuable to us in this way. And <clears throat> when I said I'd gone on long enough, I asked Woodward to join me in my office. And I said to him, I think you need to tell me the name of this person. And Bob paused, thought, and he said, I will tell you if you insist. But you should know that I have given my word I would never reveal his name. His career would certainly be endangered, and maybe more. And I had to, I had to make a quick decision. And I thought, and I said to myself, the Nixon people were going to drag us into court, put us under oath, and, make a, and ask us who this guy was. I know Bob wouldn't tell. He had a history of not telling out of Montgomery County. So he would wind up in jail. I knew I would not tell, and I wouldn't perjure myself. And I decided that in such an event, as many of us as possible should remain free to continue the investigation rather than being locked up in jail. So I said to Bob, let's leave it where, where it was. And as far as I know, I know that Howard and Ben did not know either at that point. I know that Carl did not know at that point. And we left it there. It's important to remember that uh, we never published anything uh, on Deep Throat Say So. He was, uh, he was helpful in confirming, directing, and so on, but we always had to have two other sources for all information, separate, with separate knowledge or whatever the information was, and whose names we did know. So we weren't, we weren't put in a compromising position by that. Yes. Hi. Before I get to my uh, question, I want to tell you that I've enjoyed your talk, and I'm looking forward to purchasing your book and reading it. And here's my question. I'd probably ruffle some feathers, but I'm curious, what is your opinion on today's mainstream media uh, silence, spreading of pop propaganda, refusing to rep report the news accurately, and misdirection? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. She, she uh, about anything in particular? She wanted, she's concerned just about, so, about media overall. silence and misdirection on Misdirection on and refusal uh, to accurately report the, the news, basically. About any particular subject? That's oh, very Oh, Fast and Furious, Benghazi, uh, uh, any, any of the other scandals past oh, previous yeah. years. Well, I don't yeah, know, know that the thing. media is refusing to report on Benghazi. I think you could possibly say that in the media have not paid enough attention to exploring Benghazi, or you could make the contrary argument that they've explained what is explainable. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't erect a, a, a blanket condemnation on Benghazi. Uh, it's been reported in sufficient detail to arouse people's suspicion about what has been officially acknowledged. Um, I don't know whether further reporting uh, what would what would be productive in further reporting? Where would be the the uh, uh, the, the crucial point that would open up the whole uh, matter? I think it's worth somebody's attention, but I don't think it's a conspiracy to keep it silent. It it has it has uh, it's had a decent run in the press, I think. Joanne Omang, hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, hello. Hello, Harry. Joanne. Um, I'm like, I'd like to ask you, you spoke about various of the revolutions you witnessed and reported about. 
What about the advent of women in journalism, advent of women in the newsroom and especially at the Post? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, there were two great, uh, two great uh, um, cultural changes in, in my time in the newsroom. And one involved women and one involved blacks. And both were very, uh, very uh, uh, driven movements uh, seeking uh, full, factual, actual equality uh, in all aspects of the newspaper operation. And both were frustrated by the pace of change that was taking place. And there was, I think, a great deal of, uh, of bitterness, certainly on the complainant side, and, and some uh, feeling on, on, on the other side of the table that we're doing all we can. Well, there was a large disagreement that we actually were doing all we could. And, uh, but it was a time of transition, and the transition worked. And it worked very successfully. And you today have a, a, a journalistic body that I think is substantially, if not totally, integrated and, and uh, is far the better for it. And a mindset that is divested of the sort of unintentional racism and sexism that nevertheless uh, was probably in the makeup of even the best uh, intention uh, managers and editors. Uh, so I think it was part of the, uh, while we didn't enjoy it at the time that it was going, <laughs> it was going on, we should have, because it was a great thing to have happened, and it was a great thing to have been part of. I should add that now that I'm in journalism education, 70% of the journalism students at the Cronkite School, which is of more than 1,000 students at any one time, are women, and that that's pretty much the case in journalism schools around the country. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, the diversification of newsrooms that's already underway will be, will be uh, much more so in the years ahead. However, we, talk, we talked earlier, we asked a question about new media. Too many of the new media startups are not very well integrated by either race or gender, uh, which is, uh, um, I, I think, something that needs to re require some attention as we move forward. Two more questions? Go ahead. To get Hi. back to Watergate, hi. Um, I'm pretty sure I know what the big mistake is that you referred to. I think it's even in the movie, but for those who don't know about it, could you tell us a little bit about the big mistake and Watergate coverage? All right, the big mistake uh, was uh, a really big one. <laughs> uh, we had been marching up a drumbeat of coverage from 1972 to 1973. And in October, we published uh, two important stories that were really a culmination of uh, Carl and Bob's work. One was about the political camp sabotage campaign waged by the White House against its opponents for years past, nothing specific to now only, but for years past. And that was, a real, that was the biggest story we published up to that point. Part of that uh, process of, of uncovering the scandal was that we found out that there was a fund that were actually turned out to be more than one fund where secret money was stashed to pay for these illegal operations. And we had identified one by one the people who had the authority to take money out of that fund. And there remained the fifth man. And we did not know the fifth man. We had an idea that he was high in the White House, but we didn't know who. About this time, Ben was being pressed. Well, first of all, the Republicans were always, from day one, pressing, who are these guys, these confidential sources? Why don't you just tell them? They don't exist. Uh, they're a man and a woman. There's a this and there that. And, and uh, if you had anything, you would tell us. And Bradley was able to shake off when the Republicans attacked us that way. But when his own friends, like Edward Bennett Williams, began to say, what the hell, why don't you put a name in the paper? You know, for Christ's sake, just for a change, right? So, so, he, <laughs> so he, put, uh, he put a lot of pressure. He said, you wanted a name. He, that, give us a name we can use. 
And in the course of uh, reporting this, Bob and Carl meet up with Hugh Sloan, who had been the financial director of the committee to re-elect the president, but who had resigned in a kind of protest. Uh, he didn't like what was going on entirely, but he was a Nixon loyal loyalist. Uh, and they talked to him, and it turned out that they, they Bob and Carl threw, questioned him elliptically, because if you would take him on head on, he would back off. So they played a little word games. And the result was that they understood him to say that he had been called to the grand jury, which was sitting, and had testified to the grand jury that Haldeman, the president's chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, was the fifth man. Well, we had our, you know, we had our fifth man, and we had what I consider the biggest story of our investigation, because when you tie Haldeman to these dirty tricks, you tie the president of the United States. No question, no question. So we go, we go with the, this is a big story. We've been working on it for weeks. We're, we're tired. We hit something called the air pocket that Bradley calls it because we come to pass deadline and we're still discussing uh, as basic essentials of the story and we can't make our mind uh, and we can't come to a decision. And we're tired of this process and we want it in the paper and we want to get on with other things. But it is the most important story, saying that the president's chief of staff uh, doled out money for these political sabotage operations. And because it was so delicate a story, I went over it. First, Sussman went over it carefully. I went over it carefully. When I was satisfied, we took it to a, a larger meeting with Br Bradley and Simons. They tore it apart. And because they were, you know, this was big canasta. And, and <laughs> they asked questions that hadn't even occurred to me. And I was mortified that it, they hadn't occurred to me. And so Bob would go out and do some more phone calling and whatnot and come on back. And they addressed every question. And this went on over a period of time. And at the last session, where we all agreed, I stood over Bob as he was pecking out the lead, and I asked him a couple of more questions, and I, what I heard disturbed me. We had from three or four sources that there was a, that Haldeman controlled the fund, different people. We had only from one source, maybe two, two sources that he had testified to the grand jury. When I saw Woodward's supply was a little bit too vague for my taste, I said to him, Bob, why don't we try putting in the first paragraph that Haldeman controlled the fund? And in the second paragraph, that Hugh Sloan testified to it uh, uh, to the grand jury. That was Bradley's name in the paper. The other source was on a condition where you couldn't put it in the paper. And, we, and as I was doing this, Bradley walks out of his office. He comes to the divide in the newsroom where the copy ran on a, on a track to the, from the uh, um, uh, signing desk to the copy desk. And it, this was not very late at night, about 7.30, quarter to 8, late for us. And he says, Thank you very much, Rosenfeld, but we will go with what we have. And what we had was that the next day, Dan Shaw goes up to, uh, to Sloan and his attorney as they are going back to court and asks Sloan whether he had testified to the grand jury. And Sloan stands mute, but his lawyer says, categorically, Mr. Sloan did not testify to that in front of the grand jury. Ooh, ooh. There it was, our biggest mistake. And it all hit the fan. 
I couldn't find Woodward and Bernstein. By the time of this, we, we don't no longer call them Woodward and Bernstein, we call them Woodstein. And couldn't find them. And when they finally called in, they reported on having retraced some of their sources and they still couldn't find the mistake. And Howard Simons wanted us to immediately retract. And I begged Bradley not to do that, but to let us find out where our mistake was, if there was a mistake, where our mistake was. Because the thing that I dreaded most was making a correction and then subsequently correcting the correction. I thought that would really undermine us. And Bradley, as he did often, stood up and said, we stand by the story. It lasted about a week less. Howard was possibly pushing me, let's get it in the paper, let's get it, get the explanation in the paper. Couldn't, didn't have enough information. On Sunday, Senator McClellan? I don't know. No. The guy who ran against Nixon. McGovern. 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 Senator McGovern is on the, you see what, mind of an 84 year old is really sharp. Oh, 71 year old. I, you know, I, I'm 84 today. <laughs> Really? You know, really. Happy birthday. Not today, I mean, at this time. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, 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 it's, on a, it's on a Sunday morning, uh, meet the press or something, and he points to our story and says, yeah, he repeats what we said, and the phone rings. I had an office phone in my house, and the phone rings, and it's out time. He says, all right, in tomorrow's paper, we will have either confirmation of our story or apology for our story. And thank God that by that time, Woodstein had got, gathered enough information, a lot of it from the lawyer of Sloan, who had conceded that he hadn't testified to it in front of the grand jury, but that Holman did uh, control the fund and Sloan had intended to testify. Yeah, right, right. And the reason he hadn't testified <coughs> is because the government prosecutors Never didn't ask them. What a surprise. And, and, and this is where Deep Throat was so valuable. Deep Throat said to Woodward, this is a Hogerman operation. And so that Sunday we were able to go with a story that said, we were wrong to say that he had testified. He, uh, he did not because he wasn't asked, and Holman was the fifth man. That was our worst mistake. Should not have happened. We should not have let ourselves be suckered into, into that position, and we did. Oh, wise old, eyes okay. wide open. One last question. Yes, over here. Uh, what did, if you could talk a little bit about uh, Catherine Graham, uh, apparently Mitchell, she was under some pressure. Mitchell had said a rather derogatory remark, something about her anatomy, which I guess we couldn't repeat here. Uh, but could you talk it's a little bit? It's in my book. If it doesn't shock yeah. you, it's okay. uh, <laughs> If you could talk a little bit about working with her and what that was like. Well, well Catherine Graham uh, was nobody's uh, a cookie pusher. She was a very solid, dedicated person. The, the growth of the Washington Post from, from really mediocre level to a really great stature was on the first place occasion by her being the publisher, by hiring Bradley, and then supporting Bradley as he built the newspaper and launched it into these areas, always with her full support, sometimes with questions about where we write uh, and unease, but she stayed the course. First in the Pentagon Papers, when she was told by her lawyers and her financial advisors, do not do this. This will, you know, cause urination. And she did it. She did it. And she did the same in, in Watergate when she would say, how do we know we're right? And, and, but Ben would calm her down, and we would, but she stayed the course. I don't think it could have happened with Catherine Graham. Could not have happened. But I don't think it's going to happen without Ben Bradley either. But 
when I speak to audiences such as this, I always say at the centerpiece, I think you can find courageous editors a lot more often than you can find courageous publishers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Harry will be signing his book out in the hall, uh, and you can talk with him more there. Talk with us on our way out as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Here, before you sign everybody else's book, can you sign mine? <laughs> well, Leonard was the greatest of.